we have landed on the bad news for the day, and that is Todd Friel. Those of you who are familiar with Apology Alive know that I often cover Todd Friel. One of the things Todd has been doing since the pandemic is over is going out and bothering people face to face, Ray Comfort style. Now, one of the things I don't like about videos from Ray Comfort and Todd Friel and the like is that the people who are answering the questions, it's frustrating to me how ill-equipped they are to answer them. Now, five years ago, I would have been very ill-equipped to answer them. So what I like to do is go through those sessions where they're doing the one-on-one -on -one evangelism and letting people know what I, with a little bit more introspection than I used to have, would give as an answer in the chance that it may give you more to think about or perhaps an avenue of discussion that you can make if your Christian friends and family approach you with the same tired old questions. So let's go back out to the street with the great Todd Friel. I'm really simple. So as an engineer, a numbers guy, tell me, why do math equations always come up with a consistent answer? Because they're always constant in this universe. There are, they, that's right. Okay. So what seems to be the scenario here, we'd get a cold open, we don't know. This seems to be an engineering student who stepped up to the microphone to talk to Todd. Todd asked, why does math always give the same answers? And the student here said, because there are constants in the universe. You probably are realizing this in the chat, but this is a terrible answer. Math gives consistent answers because math is really a set of definitions and a set of rules to play by when operating on them. So we define four as the number that represents four individual things collected in a group. We define addition as putting objects in multiple groups together and then recounting what those are. Subtraction is taking items away. Division, square root, integrals. These are all really just rules that we agree to of operations that we're going to perform on numbers, which themselves are definitions. So without those definitions changing, there's literally no chance that math can change. There's no supernatural entity needed to keep math from flying off the rails. We're not going to wake up tomorrow and figure out that five is really nine, right? Because these are definitions. All we need to do is not change them for math to be the same from day to day. Sorry, student, and I've forgotten his name. It's not that there are constants in the universe, unless you're saying that the rules of math and the definitions of math are constant. But they're not necessarily constant. We could change them, but we'd all have to agree to them. So as long as we agree what math is, it stays the same. No big deal. No God required. There's constants, but how, what makes them constant? Laws of physics. Again, just not changing them. What makes them constant? We, we don't change them. It would be very hard for the whole world to wake up tomorrow and say, you know what? I don't think addition should be this anymore. Addition should be something else. Physics and math. Laws of physics. All right. But who wrote those laws? Oh, man did. Okay, so this is a, always a frustrating one because it gets conflated. Todd is conflating laws like legal laws with scientific laws. Scientific laws are not prescriptive. They don't tell anyone what to do like a speed limit does. A speed limit tells people what to do. A scientific law describes observations for which we have never seen an exception, or at least I understand that scientific laws can sometimes have constraints on it, that this law applies under certain conditions. Those are constraints again, but again, within those conditions, when those conditions apply, we have observed nothing else. As soon as we do observe something else, we will stop calling whatever it is a scientific law. So again, we don't need any to write it. These are purely observations. Now, oddly enough, the engineering student got this wrong. Todd, out of the blue, which is almost frustrating, will give the correct answer. We think that we identified the correct formula. We experimented enough times and we concluded that's the law. Fair enough, but that's not terrible. That's not a terrible description of what a law is. So Todd actually corrected him. Good on Todd for steel manning that one point when he's straw manning the rest of the world. Still doesn't tell me why we have consistent outcomes. Here's my premise, that if there is not a bigger constant in the universe, there's no constants in math or in science. If there's no bigger constant in the universe, we all know he's talking about God, then we, then math can't be consistent. We talked about that already. Math is just a set of agreed definitions. So it would actually take an outside force to change it. Not, we don't need an outside force to hold it together. Or in physics, 
again, physics just describes the properties of the material universe. Properties are a thing that, again, requires an outside force to change. We aren't looking to an outside force to make my black mug is just going to keep staying black until an outside force acts upon it. I'm not looking for the force that is keeping that thing black. I'm not expecting to look down later in the stream and find that it's yellow. That's the kind of world that Todd thinks it there would be if there was no God. And that's just crazy. Laws observe properties. We don't need an outside force to explain that properties don't change on their own. It would be weirder if properties did change on their own. I would consider that to be proof of a God. That would be miracles. Show those. Because if we are random, nothing, you know, we kind of came together over billions of years and got our act together and became moral, started walking upright, developed eyes, nose, ears, mouth, taste, all of that. We've evolved that way. There, there wouldn't be any constants. We would never have anything that was certain because it's all random. Okay. Because it's all random. Pause a little early there. We've, I've already talked about it. The properties of material, the properties of energy, the properties of matter, properties of time and space. We're not surprised that those stay the same without an outside force. So we can count on those. But what I'm actually going to take exception here is Todd's characterizing that our evolution and that other things are, was random. It's actually the opposite. I, I know it appears random to us because we don't have a full way to evaluate all of the inputs. So for example, when you roll a dice, we consider that rice, dice roll to be random because the factors of the friction on the surface that it lands on and the speed with which you do it and the spin, all the different, and whether the dice is actually evenly weighted and the wind and the temperature of the room, there's so many factors that go into where that dice is going to land. We're willing to actually just call that random because we can't control all those factors, nor can we predict all those factors. And that's for a simple dice roll. When it comes to evolution and matter coming together, all these different things, those are also mutations that natural selection acts upon. Those are not random, actually. Though we, if we knew enough and could model well enough, we would know when a mutation is going to happen. And if we had sufficient input, we would actually be able to predict what the mutation would be. It's just that we don't know what all those factors are, nor do we have the computational power to factor it all in and come up with an accurate prediction. But that actual prediction could be made because again, just like Todd agreed, the universe is operating on natural laws that don't change moment to moment. Now, I know ever I'm probably guessing there's going to be the word quantum in the chat a lot right at this moment. I happen to be in the camp that agrees that quantum effects are of the same type. It's just that we can't begin to categorize or understand all the factors that go into quantum effects. So it appears to us to be random. That doesn't mean that it is actually random and maybe it is, but what happens at the quantum level doesn't actually affect as far as we can tell uh, these other levels. I don't think that's a good gotcha. That's a good part. I don't even know why I went on that tangent. Don't say quantum in the chat. Anyway, all this to say, Todd characterizing our evolution as random is getting it wrong and he doesn't understand what's happening because mutations always happen within one of the four elements that DNA will be. It's not like it comes up with a fifth one and we know how natural selection works. It picks the survivability traits. And if something doesn't let an organism survive, then those genes won't get passed on. These are all non-random things, Todd. So you're confusing this poor student. If Todd is in your area and asks you why things are random, assure him that they're not, that you're deterministic. At least Paul G is. According to evolution. Fair enough? Fair enough. See, what I'm trying to get at is... Yeah, it's not fair enough. Evolution is not random. It's a little suspicious that all of these things happened all by themselves without anything to guide them or to think them through. They were guided by natural selection. The things that help an organism survive better so that it can reproduce is going to help it reproduce more. And the things that kill it off are going to kill it off. That's a guiding process. Okay, so for instance, let's say you had your teeth, you had your throat, you've evolved all of that, you've got peristalsis working its way down, but you haven't evolved your stomach yet. What would happen to your teeth and to your throat? I would not, I would not know. They'd go away because you don't need them for anything. Oh, you had to happen. All right, so Todd is describing the di digestive system in some way, or at least the nutritional system that we have. He described teeth, 
and your ability to swallow and all these kind of things and saying, well, what if you didn't have a stomach? Then none of it would work. Well, yeah, Todd, because you have picked the thing that probably evolved first and took it out of the equation. I know you're going to talk about irreducible complexity. We'll get to that. But the problem with all these systems that you think are irreducibly complex is that they are reducible. So an organism that has a stomach, a place to take nutrients and digest them properly without those digestion processes of negatively affecting the rest of the cell or the body is going to have a survivability advantage. So probably in that system, I don't, I'm not a biologist. I could be wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I'm guessing that the stomachs, the places to hold nutrients appeared on the scene before teeth or before we were able to swallow. Like the stomach comes first and a stomach is useful without teeth and without a way to swallow because it can just collect things. And then you add the peristalsis, the ability to swallow. You add teeth, you add all these things and that makes the thing better and better. Todd, if you, I think you've done this on purpose and I hope you haven't. I hope you're just dumb. Actually, I don't know which one should prefer. But if you are in this position, you need to think through the irreducible complexity example that they're giving and understand that they are pulling apart the fundamental thing to make it seem silly when that's not probably the way it happens. And all at the same time, it's called irreducible complexity. You're so complex that if we, we reduced a component of it, none of the other components would exist because they need each other to function. All right, I okay, so they need each other to function. No, again, things do evolve to have symbiotic relationships. But that doesn't mean that there's no earlier version that had useful functions. Again, like I said, a place to collect food in a body, in a cell, has a survivability advantage, and that's a stomach. No, I agree. Things aren't evolving teeth first. I want to ask you a question about DNA. How many cells do you have in your body? Too, too many to count. About 50 million, yeah. give or take. 50 million cells. How many strands of DNA do you have? Okay, so I guess that would depend slightly. I'm not a geneticist either. How many strands of DNA are in 50 million cells? I guess that's either 50 million, or if a strand is a pair of chromosomes, or it's 100 million, if you're saying that each chromosome is its own strand, that's not a very specific thing. Let's go with 50 or 100 million. And that I do not know. Let me put it to you this way. If we took out your DNA, first of all, we could fit it into a tablespoon. Mm -hmm. If you took out all the physical DNA in your body, it would fit in a tablespoon. Okay. But if we typed out the code, we wrote it down, yeah. you could fill the Grand Canyon with your DNA information 40 times. Okay. Does anyone know the problem with this? You probably all know the problem with this. Let's say that you had 100 million copies of Harry Potter. Would that fill the Grand Canyon a lot of times? Yeah. 100 million copies of Harry Potter would fill the Grand Canyon a bunch of times. 100 million copies of anything is going to be pretty voluminous. It's going to take up space. Here's the problem. Does 100 million copies of Harry Potter have any more story content than one copy of Harry Potter? No. Creationists love to do this. They love to pretend that the DNA that is present in every cell is more complex because there are more copies of it. That's baloney. That doesn't work. I hope you see how that doesn't work. The fact that you've made a, put 50 million copies of your DNA into the Grand Canyon, and I don't know why you'd type it out, tells us nothing at all about the complexity of the DNA. It just tells you that lots of copies of something takes a lot of space. Put it another way. If we typed out your DNA and we took that and we tried to get it to the moon, would it reach the moon? I would say, yeah, 5 million Wait. times it would. 5 million times... Todd just said, would it reach the moon? You didn't specify anything. Would it reach the moon if you put it on in like old timey calligraphy in scrolls? I guess that's one thing. What if you put it on a DVD? What if you put it on a, on a flash drive? What if you put uh, microfiche? I got you, you've given us no specifications to which to judge. For this poor guy who's answering the questions to judge whether it would reach the moon. And now you've said that it's 50 million times with literally no justification. You got to give parameters in these hypotheticals. It's useless because again, one copy is the only level of complexity you can measure. I'm frustrated today. Maybe I need a little bit more of Vice Rhino's rum. Let's try that. That is a lot of organized information. It's a lot of copies of the same information. Too complex to have happened all by itself. Just Too complex to have happened all by itself. Again, we're not, he's not giving us 
any sense of what complexity means, how complexity is a indicator of information, how DNA is information. That depends largely on how you describe it. I call it a more of a cipher. I know John Perry and others disagree, but these are all semantics basically saying you got to at least come to a definition of information that makes sense. So Todd is unloading on this engineering student who probably doesn't know a lot about biology. It's like the sunglasses you're wearing. You don't believe that those just happen. They evolve a nose thing and then they got darker and then there's a sun. You go, that's not really logical. And we, we call that a category error because sunglasses don't reproduce. If we knew that sunglasses were spontaneously reproducing, if there was a mechanism by which the offspring of the sunglasses could be different than the parents, and also a mechanism whereby the best sunglasses would reproduce and the sunglasses that were least functional for human faces would not reproduce, then you'd have some kind of analogy. This, your sunglasses aren't like dogs. Man, I'm just worked up today. I'm Canadian angry again. These are bad examples. Please don't fall for them. I don't think it's logical to suggest that we happened all by ourselves. I think somebody made you. That's those, that's not a dichotomy. It's not that it happened all by ourselves or someone made us. It's what I think. I think. Or the third option, there are natural processes which can be understand, but we don't fully understand yet by which this stuff could happen. And we know that the natural laws don't go flying apart because we don't have a God interfering with them to stop them from being regular. If the laws of the universe were not regular, we would have different laws. You're designed by your maker, a very intelligent, powerful being who's very moral because we see another set of constants in this universe, morality. I asked a young man earlier, would you be willing to tell me it's always wrong to beat up a small child? And he answered no. Okay, we took a very hard left there from describing evolution to somehow saying that there are moral laws and he's going to obviously go on to say that God requires these moral laws. When Todd asks you, is it always wrong to beat up children? What you need to do is ask Todd what he means by wrong or give him your own definition of wrong. You could say, Todd, if by wrong you mean, does it unnecessarily harm people? Then yes, beating up children would be wrong. If you mean something else by wrong, please tell me what it is. What Todd is training on, what all these apologists are trading on when they ask you right or wrong questions is your visceral emotions and your general intuition about what right and wrong are. Because most people don't think about what it means. What Todd means by right and wrong are, does it match God's commands? That's what Todd thinks are right or wrong. So my intuition that right or wrong has to do with harm and with prospering largely overlaps with Todd's version of right or wrong as in conforming with God's, but not fully overlapping. And he's trading on that coincidental overlap and our general lazy use of language to make his point. Don't let him do that. If you give an answer, either ask Todd what he means by right or wrong, or give your own definition of what right or wrong is and then answer. I'm talking to myself because I'm going to be having a big conversation like this tomorrow, which I can't wait to tell you more about, but this is what needs to happen when they bring up morality. Yes. Why? Because children, for the most part, are innocent. All right. But what if I... All right. So that actually tells me that this student's feeling about what right or wrong means uh, matches with mine. If I said, does wrong mean un is causing unnecessary harm? The student said, they're innocents and we don't want to hurt innocents. So unnecessary harm. If the student had said, hey, Todd, if that's what you mean, then we, then I'm giving you this answer. But Todd doesn't agree. That's what I mean. Todd wants to twist your words. He wants to make, use conflation to bring you around to his point. I said, I don't think they are. I like beating up small children. I think it's good to beat up small children. How can you tell me I'm wrong? If someone thinks that it's good to beat up children and we agree that the definition of good is avoiding harm, then that person and I could have a chat and I could objectively show them that because we both mean good is avoiding harm, that beating up children causes harm. And we would have a nice discussion about whether or not the action aligns with the thing we agreed that the definition was. If we don't agree on what the definitions are, as Todd's hypotheticals is, then we're never going to agree. So it's not a mystery that when people have different definitions of the same word, that they're going to use them in different ways. That doesn't prove anything about the universe or about morality. It just is a function 
of language and imprecise communication. By standards that have been set forth by religion for centuries, that is immoral. That's a terrible answer. We don't know that something's immoral because of centuries of religions, be they Christian or otherwise. Again, that would be feeding into Todd's definition. The student has clearly never thought about this before. If you ask Todd, does right or wrong have to do with suffering and pain avoidance and well-being, then we don't need to appeal to any religions. It's not a societal construct. If we agree that's what it is, we agree if we don't. That, that could be that religion has written some of those things down, but if there is not a moral constant behind them, then it's just one set of people telling another people what to think. Yeah. Not if you pre-agree to goals. That's why I think that we need to have these conversations and both agree what morality is before we have the conversation. If you don't agree what morality is, don't even have the conversation. But if you agree on what it is, then you don't need a tiebreaker in the sky to come down and declare what the right answer is. You have a discussion about how well the proposed action aligns with the common goals. This is not hard. I don't understand why this is hard and why people fall for this when a short amount of thinking should clear things up. Ryan? Yes. So I think the moral constant in this universe is God himself. That's why we know that it is wrong to beat up small children, to punch. No, we know that beating up small children is because that really applies to the definition that I have of wrong, and that is unnecessary harm. Somebody in the face. We know that's wrong, but the reason... We use heuristics, and our brain makes shortcuts for decisions that we make over and over again so that we don't have to actually put in the full weight of decision-making every single time. So, for example, we train ourselves to not run over pedestrians. We don't have to sit every time and weigh the pros and cons about whether we should run over pedestrian because previously we've done the math, decided it's too much paperwork or that we care about humans or whatever is the reason we don't run over pedestrians. And now our brain just takes it on autopilot. We have a heuristic. We have a mental shortcut. that We don't reconsider all the factors every single time. That's the same thing with morality and these moral instincts. At some point in time, we came to that conclusion. Now we just repeat. If I know about the concepts of right or wrong is because God is the standard of right and wrong. All right. And that's the end of the conversation. That's the end of what Todd posted. We don't know what happened to the student. I'm guessing it actually was weird. This student seemed like maybe he did buy into some stuff. So I'm not even sure that they were a non-believer. Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. But I hope that some of those pieces of feedback, the way I would answer Todd, would give you something to think about. Perhaps will be something you can introduce in your conversations when you have these questions of evolution or the origin of the universe or laws of morality or laws of nature. All those things when they come up with believers who you may talk to, let's be more precise with our language, let's agree to definitions, and hopefully we can avoid falling into the pitfalls where Todd thinks he's won something because he has not. And that was our final topic of the day. So let me know in the chat, in the comments, did I make a mistake? You have a better way of answering Todd on one of these questions? Or once again, if you don't have a comment, leave me your favorite emoji to let me know how this made you feel.